blue sky catastrophes for piano and live computer interactive processing. It also has multi-channel surround sound. The basic idea is that the computer generates music for the performer to play. The performer does their best sight reading that. It's the first time they've seen it before. And then the computer assesses how well they sight read. <laughs> and it's sort of a game-like structure in which uh, if they sight read really well, the computer will then prompt harder, more challenging, more complex music for the performer to play. And if they didn't do so well, then it will prompt a little bit easier music. And so it's, it's sort of a feedback loop that happens over the course of the, of the entire piece where the computer is generating material for the performer to play, and then the performer tries to execute it, and then the computer responds. But there's also additional elements that happen. There's a degree of compositional control that uh, we as composers kind of enact over the course of the piece to, to push things in one direction or another. The computer also has a degree of its own will, kind of driven by several algorithms that are underneath the hood. It also is generating an additional piano part that we have sort of dubbed the phantom piano, which accompanies the live pianist as well as some live generated electronic elements like um, these harmonic basins or live echoing pings. And of course the, the spatialization that happens to kind of move the sounds around the concert space. So there's this, uh, you know, a, a pretty wide degree of unpredictability and chaos that happens, but then there's also moments of stability and periodicity that we kind of cycle back and forth and explore that kind of middle space between predictability and unpredictability. Maybe it starts back when I asked you to write me a piece, Martin. How many years ago was that? It was definitely more than a decade. It went through many different iterations, that piece. And I think what really changed it for me was going to your Piano Spheres concerts and then hearing you emerge as a composer where you were working with media, where you had spoken text as well as projections. How could we make something that's going to be different every time and have a great deal of your personality in it too, you know, as a kind of co-composer in a way. It stems from a long-term interest uh, on my part on uh, working with fractal and chaotic algorithms, dynamical algorithms, particularly what are called nonlinear systems, meaning you can't, the end result is not always the sum of its parts, right? But things emerge out of a kind of cascade of amplification, you can think of it that way, where really small changes in whatever initial conditions you set up become really large and unpredictable things that are, can be interesting. Not always interesting, but they can be. The kinds of things I was doing way back when had to do mainly with pitch mappings, you know, taking those algorithms and say, well, what kind of harmony, what kind of pitch emerges from those interactions? So I did some pieces with that, but then very quickly that I sort of started to wonder, well, I wonder if there could be some sort of form that's generated from this, something that's larger and structural could emerge from this. And so I started to do some experiments and that was really around the time, Seth, that I got to know you and your work as a student and you started to develop interest in algorithmic music and of course, programming you're doing with live capturing of score or live generation of score and interaction with performers. So it seemed like a really good marriage at that point to start thinking about ways we could apply that shared idea and interest in algorithms and in generative form uh, with the kinds of thing research you're doing, Seth. Yeah, I think you mentioned the piece to me for the first time in maybe 2013. We didn't quite do anything until maybe 2014, we started kind of tinkering with some ideas. And I think actually your prompting with the live notation aspect of, of the composition you're proposing really um, helped direct a lot of the other pieces that I then have composed since, even though this piece is, it's almost like a, a for me, a bookend. It kind of started a certain research pursuit and is only now coming to fruition after I've completed many other pieces that explore live notation. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, in terms of what what we did at the piece starting around 2014 was taking some, some of the compositional concepts that you were exploring with Vicky and writing them down and trying to implement them, um, at least on my part, trying to program them uh, in the computer and write a piece of software that would be listening to a live performer and then generating notation for that live performer to then read and just creating this um, kind of on-screen notation system that would facilitate it, but 
really trying to um, emphasize that computer performer, even composer kind of feedback network to create this kind of like, you know, three part collaborative system. California Ear Unit, the band I was in for many years, did a, a piece by Lindsay Vickery. We were sight reading the scores in real time. The full score was projected on a screen and we were all reading our parts in real time off of the screen. And I just remember at the time, not only were we, you know, sight reading in, in real time, the audience was actually seeing what we were sight reading. For me, anyway, as I've developed this piece, a major historical touch point for me is John Cage, mm. who I think embodied that variability and that everything is definitive type of approach for a performance. I feel like a lot of the work that I've done, including this piece, is sort of a reaction to the types of pieces that can be easily documented and that there can be like a, an authoritative version of a piece. And I, I like the opposite of that, where the pieces really can only exist in the moment of performance. And outside of that, any documentation can only capture kind of slice of a you know, multiverse. I really, really love that idea. I remember as long as we're talking about sort of touchstones that I remember hearing a piece by Joshua Freed way back in 1993 at a conference called Travelog. It was called Headset Sextet. Headset and Sextet, that's right, yeah. What's called headphone driven performance where your job as a performer is to reproduce what you hear at any given moment as instantly as you can, not to think about it, but just to do it instantly. And you're just constantly in this moment of ever-changing kaleidoscopic material coming at you. But that notion of a piece that's different every single time was really exciting to me, you know, and how that was implemented. You know, again, going back to Cage, what you said about Cage, Seth, that really resonates with me as well. This idea of, you know, removing your composer's or performative direct ego from the situation, not entirely, obviously, but to a to a large degree, which makes the piece interesting and exciting every time we hear it. Another like historical touch point for us, a piece that you introduced to me, Martin, by uh, Nick Didkowski called Zero Waste, Absolutely. which is yeah. also a piano piece with computer interaction with live notation, wherein the piece recycles the notation into you know live performance and then evaluating that live performance. And uh, basically it's kind of like a copy machine where you're just copying over and over and over again and the material gets distorted and warped in a kind of uh, unpredictable way. And I, th I think it highlights some, some issues that we also deal with, which is isolating and dr drawing our attention to the evaluation process and like how you do that. So like the pitch detection and kind of rhythmic evaluation means that we use, they all of a sudden start to insert themselves as the hidden elements behind this piece, like the hidden players. And we start to hear that in, in much the same way that Nick Didkowski's piece yeah. is almost exclusively about like the pitch and rhythm detection system that he mm -hmm. built. But there was another fellow I wanted to mention. I, I met him at a conference back in the 90s, um, a computer music conference, Peter ba Bales from Belgium, who something he said really struck me. And I, could, I can point to that as a kind of germinating idea for this piece. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, physicality is often undervalued in computer art. It, it got me thinking, and it's the same you could say is true of computer music and most computer music that I knew of the time, which involved very tightly constructed scores and electronics that were highly integrated predictably so. Mm -hmm. And I always thought to myself, that would be interesting to take some of these same ideas of, you know, fractal chaotic feedback loops and insert a performer dynamically within that and physically, the physicality of that performance, the force feedback as, as being meaningful. And, and I think that's one thing that we're trying to do here. So the notation screen that Vicky is looking at during the performance is designed to be as quickly and efficiently sight read as possible. That was our utmost concern. If you're looking at it, there's two systems. There's a top system, which represents the music that uh, Vicky is playing right now, should be playing right now. And then there's a bottom system, which shows her what's coming up next. And of course, she has the ability to move that like coming up next music up to the top display by pressing a foot switch MIDI controller that will bump that up to the top and then generate new material in that bottom system for her to play next time she presses that foot switch. 
And then the notational elements are fairly simple and they're, they include pitches and rhythms, dynamics, there's occasionally uh, text indications and the musical phrases that are displayed are never more than a couple bars long and they always fit on the display. So it's usually fairly short musical passages that she's reading. There's, there's also on that same screen, there's uh, the total kind of performance evaluation score. And that's something that I know I went back and forth on whether that should be displayed for you to see because it's such an underlying you know, driver of what happens. I think when Seth and I discussed, we were thinking very much like a game. Thank you for not adding like gongs or buzzers. Or like <laughs> electric shocks. <laughs> That's the next iteration. Vicky has a lot of control about how things advance through the piece. So things, as you mentioned, um, Seth, there's a feedback loop created between the performer and the, and the computer. The computer is listening to the performer, the performer is reacting to the computer, but the performer, Vicky in this case, also has a chance to advance things at her will. So if she's enjoying something, if she's enjoying a phrase or wants to linger for a while, or even look at something the computer has given her and practice it in her head before advancing to the next screen and playing it, she can do that. So in this way, every performance, as you mentioned, will be completely different. I think maybe one thing um, that hasn't come out yet about the whole process is that while I'm sight reading a, a motif, it, and they're usually quite small, like maybe two measures, um, at that point, I have the option of repeating that or using that material to improvise with, and then also at the same time deciding when I'm going to move forward and read the next bit of information the computer's generated for me. So as a performer, uh, what's happening in my head is, is kind of three things. I'm sight reading the initial information. I'm then repeating it or improvising with it and thinking about how this is going to fit into the overall arc of the piece. And then I've also usually forwarded the computer with my foot. So I'm seeing the next piece coming up but I'm still playing the previous piece. So it really feels like you can feel like little different parts of your brain light up, you know? <laughs> so I'm holding the new information back here, but I'm still kind of practicing it ahead of time while I'm still improvising on the old information and then hoping that I can tie them together in a cohesive way. And it's really thrilling. Um, and it's also in a very um, per perhaps Buddhist sense, it, it demands, it forces you, it takes you by the throat and demands you be present in the moment. Yeah. I remember, in fact, when I first talked to you about this piece, I remember your question was really a profound one. And you said, what makes you assume that a performer would be comfortable being in a live performance situation in sight reading? And I hadn't thought of that adequately. I just said, oh yeah, well, this will be fun. Anybody would love to do this, right? I thought rather naively, very naively as I think about it. And, but it, it got me thinking more along the lines of the very kind of thing that we've set up where you have a lot of agency in the piece. But it also, it also addresses this whole damaging mindset. I think most classically trained musicians have that, that everything has to be perfect or you have to be striving towards a kind of perfection, which can be so stultifying because in this piece, if you make a mistake, it's really, it, there are no mistakes. And if you do misread a note, it generates interesting material that then generates more interesting material. And in a way, it's it's kind of like um, to go back to your fractal basis. It's sort of like existing in a multiverse, you know, where one set of decisions automatically tosses you into a parallel universe. And then you're hanging out there until the next little, um, you know, butterfly you step on on the path goes <laughs> into the next multiverse. When Seth and I were planning the piece, we had many, many discussions and back and forths and many, many iterations of sort of the global boundaries of the piece, meaning the big form where big things happen is preset and is timed, such as a cadenza always happens at six minutes, 20 seconds, always in the first, after a very short time, in the first three minutes, things begin to, to coagulate, if you will, or hover around a um, tonality or modality. We can quantize the pitch space. So it's not always all 12 pitches bombarding us, right? So it begins to sound more, you know, post minimally tonal there and in some places, um, always with a very strong pulse. And then we start to dissolve the pulse after about three and a half minutes. And between three and a half and six minutes, it becomes more and more dislodged from a continuous pulse. So those things 
are programmed into it, but the details of that are very, very different every time based on what you play, Vic. We wanted there towards the end of the piece to be this multi-dimensional space that opened up around the listener and around the performer that picked out certain harmonies or tonality pitches that the computer perceived happening through what both it was generating, but also what you were playing, mm -hmm. right? So it's just kind of interesting. The computer becomes kind of introspective as well as listening to what you're playing. And those could be the results of accidents or things that the computer has given you. Mm -hmm. And it, I, as I recall, Seth, it's kind of taking an average of these things saying, well, I'm seeing a lot of A flat here. So I'm just mm -hmm. gonna ping around that A flat over mm -hmm. here and pick up these sonorities. So we create what, what we referred to earlier as a kind of harmonic basin or attractors. And that's also one of the features of these algorithms, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, these so-called strange attractors or attractor points that emerge um, in chaotic algorithms. Mm -hmm. They create kind of little vortices of activity, right? So we translate that into the pitch space. But in terms of the, the movement that kind of grows and grows, uh, I think the trajectory of the piece really is like kind of starting on stage centered on the piano. And then it becomes in many ways more expansive, but, but specifically talking about the spatial element, it starts to kind of spread across the stage, then spread to the sides of the concert hall. And then by the end of the piece, one of the pictures or images that we discussed was this idea of the live pianist kind of being chased or chasing this phantom piano kind of around the space. Um, and the way that it does that is different every time and it's dependent on all of the evaluative scores that have happened inside the algorithm over the course of the piece. And in particular, one, one spot that is kind of different from the rest of the entire piece is the very end of the piece where this is something we, you know, to be honest, kind of struggled with trying to figure out how to end a piece like this and what we came up with, I'm actually really pleased with, which is a number of kind of like predetermined endings in almost like a choose your adventure style <laughs> narrative where basically depending on how well you did over the course of the piece, uh, you have different endings that open up uh, as a possible ending that also include these spatial elements, whether it's gonna be kind of pinging everything at the very end or kind of swirling up to the back to the center of the stage or, or what have you. Um, and so I think that that's uh, kind of an interesting, much like the beginning of the piece. And we mentioned the cadenza, there's these kind of more predetermined areas of the, of the piece. And the ending is definitely one of those more kind of predetermined, but it's still open. I, I forget how many endings we came up with, maybe six or so. Yeah, that, I think it was like half a dozen. Yeah, and, and kind of, we don't know which one it's gonna end with. Sometimes when I play the piece, I get overly influenced by the name of it, you know, Blue Sky Catastrophe. And I <laughs> see this like collision happen. And then in slow motion, all the debris and everything slowly filter out of the sky until at the end, you, you just have the blue sky without the catastrophe. And, and yeah. I, <laughs> so the end you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because what we haven't mentioned, what also happens in the piece is, is just that at the beginning, you know, very pulse centric, but little by little, the phantom piano dislodges itself from the real time pianist because we start to explore quarter tone, you know, different tunings inside the, those semitones. They become a little bit more prevalent based on what you play, by the way, the computer is analyzing that. And um, so that detuned space comes alive itself as a separate personality. And then at the cadenza, everything breaks apart, right? It's just massive explosion of sound for about 20 or 30 seconds. And at that point, the Phantom Pianist has become even more dislodged from the pianist. And that's when things can start to sort of spin around and, and, and these harmonic basins also emerge. That is something that we set into the overall form or the overall trajectory of the piece. There will be that gradual kind of dislodging, you know, yeah. cat catastrophic, you could call it, cadenza. Yeah. And also because it uses microtones, it almost feels like like the physical piano is having an out of body experience. <laughs> like the piano starts to rise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and it then it does separate out. I just have to make sure I stay seated on my bench. <laughs> yeah. 